Welcome to the first panel of seven that will ask the first presidential candidate we'll be hosting questions for the next hour. My name is Judith LeBlanc. I'm the director of the Native Organizers Alliance, one of the co national co-sponsors of the forum. I'm a member of the Caddo Nation, and I'm very excited and happy that we have such an esteemed panel of questioners for our first candidate. So we would like to welcome to the stage Mark Charles, the only American Indian candidate for president. He joined us in Iowa, and we're so happy that he's come back. You'll be standing. Okay, you won't. Right chair. So introduce yourself. Yeah. Introduce yourself. I'm Scott Demaris. Yeah. I go, I'm fifth grade. I go to Snowy Chow, Iowa. And wait, what's this? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nu Ronaldo James. I'm a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe in northern Nevada. Thank you. So, Mr. Charles, the cool seat, not the hot seat. So the way this panel is going to be conducted is the way that all candidates will be, will be um, joining us. We're going to spend one hour. The, the candidates will have 10 minutes to open, to give an opening statement. And then each of the seven panelists who are representing the fact that we have seven states where the Indian vote is the swing vote that will determine the outcome of 77 electoral votes. Each questioner will have, in total, seven minutes, which means you get to ask a question and the response and a possible follow-up question must all be done within seven minutes if we're going to stay within the one-hour framework. And so are we, are we ready for this? I think we all have questions. And when you ask your question, you can introduce yourself, your nation, and your state and organization. Yat A. Mark Charles Yenishia, Tsin Bekay Dana Nishle, the Tohiglini Bashachin, Tsin Bekay Dana Dashache, the Tolichini Dashanella. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother happens to be American of Dutch heritage, which is why I say Tsin Bekay Dana. Translated loosely, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My father's mother, my second clan, is Toi Higlini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bekei Dene'a. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. Before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Southern Paiute. I appreciated the greeting we had this morning. I've appreciated all of the, the, the Nevada tribal leaders who were on the stage earlier talking about the issues that they're facing. And I want to honor the Southern Paiute as the indigenous peoples of these lands. Um, I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands. I like to acknowledge the people whose land I'm on no matter where I go. It's important to remember, first of all, that these lands were not discovered. There was a history, a story, a people to these lands long before Columbus got lost at sea and long before white settlement came this far west. And I also like to um, acknowledge the people whose land I'm on because it helps me to walk more humbly, knowing that there's a story, there's a history that predates what we've been taught in school and what is in our history books. And it's important to keep that at the forefront of our mind no matter where we are or, or um, what we're doing. I want to talk just for a few minutes about my campaign. And I will be honest with you, I have devoted the first seven months of my campaign. I announced my campaign last um, May. And I was very intentional because I deeply believe that if you want to 
be president of the United States of America, if you want to help govern these lands that encompass Turtle Island, the most respectful and appropriate place to begin your campaign is not to white landowners in Iowa or New Hampshire, but to the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And so I have been traveling around in Arizona, in New Mexico, in Colorado, in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, in Oregon, many states around this country, I have been traveling and campaigning almost exclusively to native peoples, allowing Indian country to help shape my message and to help me see it, see my message through the lens that's coming out of Indian country. When we have candidates campaigning in Iowa and New Hampshire, Iowa, which is the sixth whitest state in the country, and New Hampshire, which is the fourth, their lens, their message gets shaped by that culture and by those people. This is why at the debate tonight, there will not be a single person of color on the stage because they have been forced almost literally for a year to campaign to white landowners. And that has challenged the people of color because they are often seen as a threat because they come with oftentimes a racial critique or other things and their message is not as palatable to the demographics of those states. So this is why I am running, first of all, as an independent, so I can decenter Iowa and New Hampshire. And it gave me the privilege of campaigning for seven months in Indian country. Now, often people will say, well, you're doing this, but you have no chance of winning. Well, there's, there's some things that we don't fully understand and that I want to help explain to you of, of why I think running as an independent and doing it the way I'm doing it actually, it may be the most difficult way to get to the White House, but it's the few paths that actually let me get there. To run as an independent, you have to get on the ballot in all 50 states. And every state has a signature requirement. Some it's as low as two or 300. Others it's as high as almost 200,000. I believe here in Nevada the number is 9,608. Um, early in my campaign I had my research team do some research and I asked them to look at the 2016 signature requirements. They're still not all out for 2020. But we looked at the 2016, the number of signatures in every state. And we looked at the 2010 census data and we looked at the number of natives in every state over the age of 18. And we found that in every state, the number of natives over 18 exceeded the number of signatures required. What that means is Native America, almost single-handedly, has the power within itself to put me on the ballot in all 50 states and to bring the voice and the questions and the things that I'm saying not just into this primary season, but into the general election. And I don't have time to go into it now, but we even have a strategy of how we can actually get all the way to the White House. Yes, running as an independent and campaigning first to Indian country is not the typical path to the White House, but it's also why we have not had radical change in our nation in 250 years, and why as recently as 2005, the doctrine of discovery is still being referenced by the Supreme Court as the legal precedent for land titles, and our national football team in Washington, D.C. still has a racist name for a mascot. It's because we, we've never had anyone who is willing to decenter whiteness so that we can actually bring the message that needs to be brought with a strategy that can get us all the way to the White House. And so, as you listen to the dialogue we have today, I don't want you to listen like I am some wide-eyed, young native man, well, I'm actually not that young, <laughs> native man who doesn't understand what he's trying to do. No, I am serious. I am not running a protest campaign. I am not doing this to raise issues. I am in this race because I literally believe there's an opportunity for, for my campaign to win for us to get to the White House. And the first step of that campaign, the most important part, is what I've been doing for the past seven months, which is talking and letting my campaign be shaped by Native America. And now I want to use this message to gather the signatures, to put my name on the ballot, so that we can bring this message into the general election and even possibly get me all the way to the White House. So a hat for listening today. Thank you for, for being here, and I'm excited to engage with these questions and the thoughtful people who are on the stage with us right now. Thank you, Mark. 
I think I think Mac Charles probably has a, a difficulty on this panel because I have a Boston accent, and every time I say his name, he winces. <laughs> Mac Charles. All right, shall we begin? Hello again. Uh, my name is William Maine. Like I said, everybody calls me Snuffy. I forgot to mention the tribe that I'm from. I'm from the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation in Montana. We have actually three tribes at Fort Belknap. We have the historical tribes, the Grovant, which is, you probably never heard of, but it is the same as uh, Arapaho. Uh, we also have the Assiniboine, which you probably never heard of, uh, which is the same as uh, Sioux. And then we have a created tribe that was created by the United States government in 1935 called the Fort Belknap Indian Community, which is, uh, was created under the IRA, Indian Reorganization Act. But my question for uh, Mr. Charles is that we have a number of classes of tribes in this country. And, and first of all, I'd like to say that you know, I don't, think, I, I don't believe that we're all tribes. I think we're all one people. It's just that we were given different bands, were given different names by the white man. And uh, so, but we have various classes of, of tribes that are, some are unrecognized totally, some are state recognized, some are federally recognized. Uh, Mr. Charles, what would, what is your view of the government-to-government -government relationship that the United States government would have with all tribes, regardless of what they classify them as? Yeah, thank you. That's a very important question. Um, when we talk about tribal sovereignty, and I think one of the things that we can tend to struggle with as, as Indian people, and this is due in part to the historical trauma that we, are exper that we experience, both in our communities and throughout the history, is that we can allow ourselves to be defined by the white landowning male. And so we will look to them to define us and to, well, we have a treaty with them, and so we're a tribe, and they're not a tribe, they don't have a treaty. And I strongly believe that tribal identity comes from within Indian country. It does not come because the white man chose to recognize you or have a treaty with this group and a treaty with that group. The, the U.S. government can decide who they have a treaty with, but they do not get to decide who is a native nation and who is not. That is a dialogue that needs to happen within Indian country. I get asked about tribal sovereignty a lot when I travel and speak, and I tell people that tribal sovereignty, it feels in many ways because of this domestic dependent relationship we've had historically with the United States of America, that native tribes are sovereign over our lands like your teenage child is sovereign over their bedroom, where you can put a sign on the door and you can, you can do what you want, but ultimately it's, it's a bedroom in your parents' house and they will let you know when they're gonna come in and move things around or do what they want to do. And that's often the experience of how we feel tribal sovereignty um, experience within our, within our native nations. And so what I would like to do, what I would like to see is, you know, as the, it's been stated many times, the Constitution states that treaties are the supreme law of the land. And when tribes have a treaty with the United States government, they have a government-to-government -government relationship. Now, it's the doctrine of discovery which is, allows the, the, the native nations to be dealt with as savages and dehumanized and treated as less than that makes it more of a parental relationship as compared to a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. But if you go back to what a treaty is and how it is defined, then that itself mandates that you have a peer-to-peer, -peer, a government-to-government -government relationship. And so one of the things that I would do as President of the United States is, first of all, I do not think the U.S. government gets to define who is and who is not a tribal nation. That is a discussion that needs to take place within Indian country, and I would want to help to create space for those conversations to happen, but the U.S. government does not get to decide. They can decide, the U.S. government can decide who they have a treaty with, they do not get to decide who is and who is not native. Second, I would want to go back and actually reestablish these treaty relationships that we already have with the native nations. 
I don't think we have to change anything to do that. We just have to acknowledge what the history is and treat the relationships the way the Constitution of the United States says we should treat them. I don't think we have to go through legal loopholes and, 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 and gymnastics to get to that point. I think we can say, yes, we have a treaty relationship with this tribe, with this native nation, and we are going to engage with that nation just as we would engage with any other nation around the world that we have a treaty relationship with. Just a real quick follow-up question since I have a little time. Um, there are tribes that have a treaty with the United States government, but they're not on the federally recognized tribe list, so the United States government overlooks those tribes. What are your thoughts on that? If there are treaties that are established that the U.S. government is ignoring, that is on the U.S. government. Those treaties have a right to be acknowledged. And, and I believe, and as, as president, I would want to look at all these treaties, not just the ones we like to acknowledge, are the ones that we, we choose to, to pay attention to. If we have a treaty with a group of people, if there's a native nation that comes forward and says, we have this treaty that was signed and we want to discuss this treaty, the U.S. government, I believe, has an obligation to engage in that dialogue. All right, good, e or good evening, Jesus. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those that weren't here earlier, my name is Ruben Vasquez. I'm the vice chairman of the Washford Tribe, the chairman of the Dressable Community, and the vice president of ITCN. Um, for those that don't know, it's the Intertribal Council of Nevada. Uh, Mr. Charles, I had one quick question regarding, um, it was talked about earlier on the earlier panel regarding uh, encroachment of uh, military bases wanting to encroach on Native American reservations or tribal trust land. What is your thoughts on that? Again, this goes back to the whole issue of land rights. And going back as far as 1823, the doctrine of discovery, a dehumanizing doctrine coming out of the Catholic Church in Europe, that basically says to, it's the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. This is the, this is the doctrine that let European nations discover these lands because you can't discover lands already inhabited, so they must have dehumanized treated us, assumed us to be less than human. And then in 1823, that doctrine literally becomes the legal precedent for land titles and gets referenced by the Supreme Court in 1954, 1985, and as recently as 2005. When the United Nations came out with their Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, originally the U.S., Australia, I believe it was New Zealand, and a few other nations refused, to, Canada refused to sign it. Now the thing that all these nations had in common is they had large indigenous populations and the thing they were afraid of, the reason they didn't sign, is because of what it did to land rights and especially consent and the indigenous people's right to their land. And so initially all of these nations did not sign that Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is the same issue we saw in play at Standing Rock. And so, again, one of the things that I'm calling for, and this is what I would say is a foundational level issue. And I do not believe, honestly, that this is an issue that we are going to win in court. Because the U.S. has used the doctrine of discovery as the legal precedent for land titles, because if you read the Constitution from preamble through the 27th Amendment, you will see it was written specifically and intentionally to protect white landowning men. The Constitution doesn't exist to give you and I rights, to give Native nations rights. It exists to protect white landowning men. This is why I'm wearing my hair in a C.A.T. and it's tied with red yarn. I'm wearing this red yarn to remind myself of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. This, this issue of we have missing and murdered indigenous hundreds, even thousands of indigenous women and girls who have gone missing, they've been murdered, they've been reported, there's no follow-up. At the last debate, several candidates, our last forum, several candidates said they would propose new laws to ensure that this demographic was protected. 
But when your Declaration of Independence calls native savages and your Constitution never mentions women, don't act surprised when your indigenous women get murdered or go missing and no one cares. This isn't a new law problem. This is a foundational problem. And my solution to deal with these foundational level issues, like land titles and like missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, is that I, I strongly believe the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation I would put on par with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. I wouldn't call ours truth and reconciliation, though, because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony, which is inaccurate. I would call ours truth and conciliation. After the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, they wrote a new constitution. After the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, the commission gave 93 recommendations for the government and the churches of what they needed to do to make sure that what happened before regarding residential schools there never happens again. This is the kind of dialogue we need. If we want to deal with these foundational level issues, we need to have this kind of national dialogue about our systems, about our foundations. And I think that is going to be the best way. And I'm, one of the reasons I'm running for president, one of the reasons I'm not just supporting another candidate is because I've learned that when it comes down to land titles, White supremacy becomes a bipartisan value. The doctrine of discovery, as I said before, was referenced as recently as 2005. I gave a TEDx talk on this, on this Supreme Court case in 2005, the Oneida Indian Nation versus the city of Cheryl of New York. It is one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime, concluding that based on the doctrine of discovery, which is referenced in footnote number one, the United Indian Nation cannot reclaim sovereignty over their traditional lands. And that opinion was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the progressive voice of dissent on this increasingly growing conservative Supreme Court. And yet even when, it came, when push came to shove and she was pressed, she wrote the opinion not just in favor of the doctrine of discovery, but using it to prop up this dehumanizing system. This is why we need this national dialogue, because when it comes down to things like land titles, white supremacy is a bipartisan value, and until we deal with the foundations, we're not going to be able to change those things. And so I care deeply about what's happening to the land and how that land is being encroached on and how it's not being used properly and how it's, the rights are being taken away from the, the tribes here in Nevada. And I think the best way to address that is through this Truth and Conciliation Commission. Thank you. How me dog ya pi chante wa stay na pe chu sa pi o ya te wa chi ya pi bi ma chi ya pi na wa shi chu cha je ki shante ai na si ma chi ya pi. Hello, my friends and relatives. I shake your hand with a good heart. My Lakota name is Oyate Wachiyan Pibi, which means people depend on her. My English name is Shante Ironhurst. I'm a seventh grader at Wendatney District School on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. We are concerned about our futures and their children's futures. If you were, if you were elected, what will you do to protect our water rights? This is a very good question, and this is one of the things, this is exactly what happened at Standing Rock, where we had the Native nations wanting to protect their water rights. They didn't want this pipeline to go through their lands, and there was this beautiful, massive protest with tens of thousands of Native peoples and hundreds of tribes coming together in a unified voice saying, to this colonial nation, you cannot drink oil and water is life. It was a beautiful moment of Indian country coming together, standing up and reclaiming our role as the host people of this land. Now, not surprisingly, the court case that was happening around the lawsuit brought against the Army Corps of Engineers who approved this pipeline going through, not surprisingly, 
the Army Corps of Engineers won that court case and the tribes lost. Why? Well, again, the Constitution doesn't exist to protect Native peoples. That's not why we have a Constitution. It exists to protect white landowning men. And so the only reason there was any relief was because President Obama worked behind the scenes to basically get the Army Corps of Engineers to go back and revisit the, the, the consent, or at least the meetings where they, they said they got consent, and, and he was able to hold off the pipeline from going through until, he was elect, until his term was over. But that also, because the, the, the tribes never won the lawsuit, it meant when President Trump came into office, he didn't even have to go back to court. He just flipped the switch and said, we're going to do this. See, this is one of the challenges. It goes back to what I was saying before about land titles, but it goes back to something even more important. President Obama, as many of you know, was probably one of the better presidents for Indian country in a long time that this nation's had. Every year he had a tribal leaders conference council and he would invite members of federally recognized tribes to come and meet with him and his staff for a day and a half in Washington, D.C. He, he actually visited the Crow Reservation, I believe it was, while he was president. He did a lot to acknowledge Indian country. But he also, like almost every other politician, did not like to acknowledge us when the spotlight was on. On December 19, 2009, Congress passed House Resolution 3326, the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. It's a 67-page bill laying out the appropriations for the DOD in 2010. Page 45, subsection 8113 was titled Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. What followed was a seven-bullet point apology. It mentioned no specific tribe, no specific treaty, no specific injustice. It basically said you had some nice land. Our citizens didn't take it very politely. Let's now just call it all of our land and we'll steward it together. And then it ended with a disclaimer saying nothing in here is legally binding. It was a horrible apology. If your child gave this apology to someone they hurt, you would turn them around and say, you go back and apologize again. December 19, 2009, that bill was put before President Obama. He was scheduled to have a public signing of the bill. He cleared the room just a few minutes before the bill signing happened, and he signed it in secret. He issued a press release about the bill. It talked about the appropriations for the DOD, made no mention of the apology. Why? I don't know. I haven't talked to President Obama. But he was in a tight political spot. It was a bad apology. If he signed it, Indian country is like, what are you doing? This is a crappy apology. But if he vetoes it, he's the president who vetoes the apology to Native peoples. So he did what politicians do, which is he stuffed it in a drawer, signed it in secret, and never mentioned it. I hosted a public reading without apology three years later to the day in Washington, D.C. We had it translated into Navajo and Ojibwe. We invited Native leaders. We invited business leaders. We invited politicians. I even sent a letter to the White House asking President Obama or someone from his staff to come and acknowledge this apology. And I got a letter back from the White House saying neither the president nor anyone from his staff will be at your event. When President Obama worked behind the scenes to get the easement held back at Standing Rock, I was waiting for him to say something bold and public about it. But he said nothing publicly about it. The problem is, is we have politicians who say bold things to us when they come and talk to us on the side. But when the spotlight gets on, they don't talk about us. These, the last symposium, the last forum, we had candidates promising that they would come here and remember us when they got to office. And the very next debate, just a few months, like a month later, they had a discussion in that debate on white supremacy, on gun violence, and on police violence. If you look at the stats of how many natives are being killed by gun violence, of what's happened to us and our communities around these issues, and not a single candidate, five of who were on the stage here, 
are in Iowa. Not a single one of them brought up Indian country. Why? That's the biggest stage. That's the global stage. And they didn't want to acknowledge us. And so the issue with water rights goes into the Doctrine of Discovery and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but it also go, or Truth and Conciliation Commission, but it also goes into that we need a president who will not just come to the side and say, I see you. We need a president under the glaring spot, spotlight of the global community being willing to stand up and saying, I am going to acknowledge these people and I am going to publicly fight for their rights, even if it hurts me or possibly even destroys me politically. And I don't see that happening in this election, and I haven't seen that happen in the past, and that is something we desperately need. I love your question. Thank you for that question. I'm from the uh, Rosebud Indian tribe. My name is Wizipra. Mr. Charles, thank you for coming and visiting Rosebud on your campaign. Uh, and also, I want to thank you for running. I think it's incredibly important that other Native people, that Native people see other Native people running for public office and, and taking that leap and, and putting yourself out there. So thank you. Uh, my question is about climate change. And uh, it is probably the single most important issue facing uh, not only us as Native peoples, but the entire globe and all of the planet. What three th policy initiatives will you pursue if you were to be elected you know, within the first 100 days? What would you push? One of the first things I would push is this national dialogue on race, gender, and class. We need, to be, we need to deal as a nation with our foundations. Second, climate change would be very, very important that we have to begin to deal with this. And I want to talk for a moment about climate change. Right now, we have the Trump administration that is bragging that they have built the most prosperous economy in the nation's history while he is literally not only disregarding, but exploiting and even destroying the environment. He is backing off regulations. He is, he is um, uh, uh, destroying even our sacred sites. He is, he is disregarding the environment in an effort to prop up corporate profits and short-term prosperity. On the other hand, we have the Democrats telling us that they can we can have a prosperous economy while we save the environment through their Green New Deal. Both parties are centering the economy. There's a, a documentary out there called Homelands. It's a documentary about native nations, indigenous peoples throughout North America. And one of the, one of the, the, the nations that they highlight in this documentary is the Athabascan people up from around the Arctic Circle. And the leader of the, of, of the people in this, in this documentary, he's talking about their creation story. And he says, in our creation story, there is a piece of the Athabascan's heart in the caribou. They hunt the caribou. They, they have a, 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 a relationship with the caribou of subsistence. And he said, there's a piece of the Athabascan heart in the caribou, and there's a piece of the caribou heart in the Athabascan. And it creates this, this symbiotic relationship between the two that they depend on each other for their existence. And he says, every year the caribou migrate, in the spring they migrate north to calf, and in the fall they migrate south um, to, to winter. And he said, when they migrate north in the spring, it doesn't matter what happened. If we had a horrible winter, we might be in famine, our people might even be starving. He said, we never hunt the caribou when they head north. If we had to hunt the caribou while they were headed north, we would destroy this relationship we had with them. And while we might eat better for a few seasons, eventually we would be spelling our own doom. Western culture 
the United States of America has been hunting the caribou while they head north for 250 years. And the environment and climate is at a tipping point. And both parties are centering the economy. One saying we're going to have a prosperous economy while we destroy the environment. The other saying we're going to have a prosperous economy while we save the environment. But both of them are centering the economy. And if you do not prepare people for difficult choices, they will not want to make them when the time comes. And so as an indigenous man who is seeking the office of President of the United States, one of the things I am going to tell and I am telling people is we need to save the environment, not just for our own children or our children's children, but for seven generations worth of children. And we cannot center the, the economy while we're doing that. We may need to prepare ourselves to make some very difficult and hard economic choices so that we can save our environment. And so not only do I want to have a plan to save the environment, but I want to prepare our people to make difficult choices so that we can actually do it. And that is something that I think is, is there is a clock that is ticking in regards to our environment. And it would be one of the highest priorities I had once we got into office so that we could begin to deal with that. Okay. Can you elaborate in, in the remaining minute what that plan would look like? I think, first of all, we have to reduce carbon emissions. We have to find a way to, to get, you know, one of the problems is right now our nation has become oil independent. And we are producing all of our own oil. In fact, we are one of the biggest exporters of oil. This is why cars are getting bigger, and you know, because oil is cheap now. We have to wean ourselves, get ourselves off of this dependence on oil. We also have to break ourselves from this notion of we all need to go everywhere in our single cars. <laughs> we need to have publicly funded mass transportation. We've already begun reducing our dependence on coal. On coal. I think we also need to look at how do we, how do we re increase our, our use of renewable energy sources. But we have to reduce our dependency on oil. And we, we have to... Um, to do that, we have to change the way we transport ourselves. You know, having everyone driving around in a big SUV, and, you know, I lived on the reservation. I know sometimes we need our big SUVs, but we have to begin thinking, how can we begin making choices so that we can begin to reduce these things? Chante Washte Nape Chuzrapi, Lisa White Pipey Munchiapi. My name is Lisa Whitepipe, and I am a council representative for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And I'd like to thank you for coming to Rosebud uh, during your campaign. Now, my question uh, is kind of a two-part question. I just I would like to know what your plan is to preserve our cultural sites, and also how are you going to going to ensure that the pipeline will not cross over our, our lands or through our waters? Yeah. So again, this this question goes back down to this Truth and Conciliation Commission. We have to figure out what to do with land titles, and we have to take tribal sovereignty seriously. When we, when, you know, this idea of consent, and it's consent just informing, or it's consent giving the Native nations veto power. Um, you know, unfortunately, because of the parental domestic dependent relationship that we have with the government, the, the federal government as Native nations, informed consent has meant informing and not really consenting. And that's an issue that has to be dealt with and, and we're not going to solve that issue until we deal with the foundations. Until we can actually get the foundations to state that we the people actually means all the people and that our treaty relationships with Native nations is just as important as our treaty relationships with other nations around the world. And so as, as president, I'm not king. I can't mandate these things. But I, I will have a much 
bigger pulpit to propose these sorts of solutions like this Truth and Conciliation Commission, like these kind of dialogues, so that we can get down to that level of, of discourse and actually begin to change the foundation. Was there a second part to that question? No, that was... Okay. Did I answer that sufficiently for you, or do you... Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me today. My name is Sherry Ely Mendez. I'm a uh, council person for the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe in Northern Nevada. Um, I'm enrolled member with the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. My father, however, is from the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska, and he was very proud of that when he was on this earth, so I need to mention that. Um, today, I, I heard so many questions regarding water and land and I know that in the forefront for the future of Indian country, the way that we get to, and this is what I believe, the way that we get to the, the level, level of sovereignty that we're looking for is we have to be economically sound and we have to be able to take care of ourselves. Until we get there, I'm looking for a candidate who can stabilize all of the programs that we have currently, health and social programs and infrastructure programs such as um, transportation and uh, transportation maintenance, those things that help us stay afloat in Indian country. I would like to see, and I'm wondering how it can happen, that we don't have to struggle every budget year to make sure that all of those programs are at least stabilized and or increased as we move forward by the need of each one of the tribal nations. Yeah. Because that is just, um, it, it's a continual struggle for us. So, so that if we can stabilize that, we can start to look at where it is we can move forward to make those obligations our own. So balancing um, the need for uh, economic development with all of the environmental needs and making sure that all of our children from birth to college are getting what they need to be successful so that the next generation is taken care of and taking care of our elders because they're our past and we, we will continue to make mistakes if we don't have them there to let us know what to do. Yeah. So how would, you, how would you approach stabilizing, for one, those social programs that we all need, and, and not only in Indian country, but across the nation, to help us to find stability and look for a way to move forward? So unfortunately, in a lot of situations, especially when you're dealing with economics, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the attention, right? It's, it, it's the, the problems you don't see or that you're not aware of that are easier to ignore, and the ones that are right in front of you are the ones that you tend to pay more attention to. And because throughout our nation's history, very few of our presidents have had a deep understanding of Indian country, because they have not had to campaign to Indian country by and large for the majority of this nation's history, because they were able to push the issues of Indian country off after the campaign onto agencies like the BIA and not have to deal with them personally, it meant that oftentimes the funding for issues and programs and things within Indian country went unnoticed and therefore went underfunded. As President of the United States, as a dual citizen, of the United States and the Navajo Nation. I am intimately aware with many of the issues facing Indian country. For three years, my family and I lived in a, in a part of our reservation between Ganado and Window Rock. We were six miles off the nearest paved, off the nearest paved road on a dirt road. We lived in a one-room Hogan, 25 feet in diameter no running water, no electricity. We had a dirt floor. We had an outhouse about 50 yards away. Our neighbors were rug weavers and shepherds, and we lived there for three years. 
I've been a patient. Our children were born in IHS hospitals. I've dealt with the lack of services. I've dealt with, the, with the, the lack of being able to communicate and connect wirelessly. I've dealt with, with having to travel. You know, the Navajo Reservation is one of the biggest food deserts in the entire country. I've dealt with so many of these issues and I am very, very acutely aware of what the issues that are facing, not because I've read or studied about them, but because I've lived them. The unemployment. I was in the, I was on the Navajo Nation living in this Hogan while the U.S. was going through the Great Recession. We hardly even talked about the Great Recession on the Navajo Nation because we have 50% unemployment in a good year. 15% would have been great. <laughs> so I was, I'm very aware of these things. And the great thing about being president, again, you're not king, but you get to propose a budget every year. And you get to present your budget blueprint to the Congress and say, these are the things I want to fund. These are the things I think we need to do. These are some of the issues that we need to wrestle with. And because of my life experience living in Indian country, living in impoverished neighborhoods. Right now we live in an African-American neighborhood in Washington, D.C. I'm very, very aware of the issues facing that community as well. Because I have not lived in, in, these, in these nice houses off in the suburbs and had this cushy life my entire life, I am very aware of what it means to live among the marginalized. And my budgets will reflect that. I cannot guarantee because I will not be king. I can't guarantee what Congress will and will not pass and what will and will not be able to get through. But I can tell you these things that I am very acutely aware of will be included in my budget. And I will publicly advocate that we need to begin funding them because I am very aware of how they are not only devastating our communities today, but they've been devastating our communities for decades and even centuries in the past. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Charles, for coming today. Appreciate it. I'm Kevin Alice. I'm an enrolled member of the Forest County Potawatomi Community in Wisconsin. And uh, like your family, my mother grew up on a reservation in northern Wisconsin in the late 30s, 40s, and 50s in a one-room log cabin with a dirt floor. <laughs> and, and those stories and, and, and that history has remained with my family uh, for almost a century. And I appreciate that you realize that you're not running for, to be a king, because the Constitution outlays a separation of powers, something I really think this country needs to get back to and understanding. But the Constitution always also represents three sovereigns, federal government, the states, and tribal government. And also in the Constitution, the president does not have the power of the purse. No way, you know, I hear a lot of candidates talking about, well, we're going to do this, we're going to buy this, we're going to do all these kinds of things, but it doesn't rest with that office. It rests with the legislature. What I would love to know, as the CEO of National Congress of American Indians, that for 76 years has been advocating to protect and advance treaty and trust in sovereign rights of tribes, protect tradition and customs, and to educate not only Indian country, not only the Hill, but the United States on who, what, and why, and everything about who the American Indian Alaska Native is. And our fourth is to improve the lives of Native Americans each and every day. If we accomplish the first three, we accomplished the fourth. So if you're president, how would you shape your cabinet? How would you shape your administration? What would the coordination within your administration look like in order to accomplish those first three bullet points I noted that are the mission, parts of the mission statement of the National Congress of American Indians? How would you do that in a way that succeeds and benefits the fourth one 
by improving the lives of Native Americans. Could you reiterate the first three bullet points again one more time? Advocate and protect treaty, trust, and sovereign rights. Yes. Thank you for that question. I appreciate that. One of the things that I feel very, that I believe very deeply, is that Native nations, Indigenous peoples, we are not the helpless victims of an oppressive colonial government. We are the host people of the land. And I love to see the way, like at Standing Rock and like through Empowerment, like by NCAI, that we have been stepping into our role, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, sometimes forward, sometimes a few steps back, but we're, we're beginning to step into our role, I would say, as the hosts of the land. And the problem is, is because the history is so incredibly dark and violent between the U.S. and Native tribes, that it's very quickly for us to both be identified as the victim and even often to identify ourselves as the victim. And so I've heard a lot of candidates say things like they would create a special place in their administration and office for Native peoples to come and advocate for the needs of our communities. Or they might even put a special, a special seat on their cabinet so the issues of Native peoples could come more, more to the forefront that still puts us in a subset, a subcategory, a, a, a not full member of this community and even of this government as President of the United States. I would love, one of the things I'm most excited about besides being president would be the opportunity to appoint a Native American Secretary of State. Could you imagine if the chief ambassador for the United States of America was an indigenous person? How would that transform our relationship with nations around the world? How would that challenge our relationship with even our allies, most of who were also colonial powers? How would that empower our people to begin to think and understand and see ourselves as different? than this victim mentality that is often pressed down on us or forced on us. So I, I am not interested in creating a subset space for Native peoples just to advocate for something. I want to see our people step into our role as the host. I would love to see Native nations lead the, 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 the process of reforming immigration law. I would love to see Native nations, Native peoples, Indigenous peoples operating within the State Department and the Secretary of State. I would love to see all of these different, there's many, many different positions where I think we could, uh, we could place Native and Indigenous peoples that would transform the way our country sees itself and transforms the way as Native peoples we see and understand ourselves within this nation. And so I don't know if I'm, tell me if I'm not answering your question fully, but this is where I feel like my administration and my cabinet would be shaped differently because I would not be treating Native nations as a subset, a vulnerable de demographic that needs to somehow be parentally protected. But instead, I would, I would seek to empower our Native nations to step more fully into their role, our role as the host people of this land. And there is a lot of expertise that our native nations have, whether it's around immigration, whether it's around the environment, whether it's around even economic issues, that I think would be a huge benefit if they were incorporated into the way this nation governs itself. Let me know if I didn't answer your question fully. We, we still, I was short on one, on one we, we have like two or three minutes left if we were short on another so one, so. Oh, Mr. Very helpful. Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Taking liberties with me here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> very helpful. Um, but I would, I would say that I, we are a subset. We are a subset that's owed special obligations that this government 
owes to us. And we are not blended in and, and to be treated just like everybody else in, in that sense. But to go even further, just to ask one more question to expand upon that, there are Native Americans that are working at Department of Education, Department of Interior, Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture. How would your administration which is in charge of spending the money that's appropriated to you, how would your administration coordinate your administration in such a fashion that betters the lives of Ameri American Indians better than what you've seen up until this point? Yeah, so... And, and perhaps you could incorporate that into your, your closing <laughs> remarks. Okay. Since we're okay. eating into your three-minute closing <laughs> remarks. Oh, I thought because we saved three minutes on another talk, I had three extra minutes. Um, so first, I, I would agree with you. We are, but I would say it's not a matter of us being a subset. We have a unique role. Subset can sound like a less than. I would say we have a different role, and I absolutely would agree with you that there are things that are owed to Native peoples because of the history and because of what was taken. So I would not disagree with you there. I would define the difference as a role rather than a subset, though, and that's the way I would try to interact with it. And, and again, the way that I, would, that I would want to utilize Native nations is not to, to come and, and just advise on how the government can meet the needs of this subset group of people, but have the Native nations empower Native nations to take a role of leadership within my administration, within our nation, to help the nation do things it is not good at doing because of its history, because of its, of its single um, this individual mindset coming from Western colonial culture, that there are a lot of things that I think the nation can benefit from when we're being led or we're being, we're, we're being instructed by the Native nations and the wisdom that they have from living in these lands since their creation stories were told. It's been an honor to be with all of you today. The theme of my campaign is I want to build a nation where for the very first time, we the people truly means all the people. If you read our foundations, the Declaration of Independence, 30 lines after the statement, all men are created equal, refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. If you read our constitution, that starts with the words, we the people. Article 1, Section 2 never mentions women, specifically excludes natives, counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. In his final State of the Union, President Obama was talking and addressing the division within our country. And he quoted the Constitution. He said, we the people. Our Constitution begins with these three simple words. Words we've come to recognize mean all the people. I heard him say that, and it sounded beautiful. And he got a lot of applause for that line. But I sat there. I've studied our history. I've lived on our reservations. I've experienced life as a native man within this nation. And I said, when? When did we decide we the people means all the people? The founding fathers didn't believe it. Abraham Lincoln didn't believe it. He was the most, eth he was the most ethnically cleansing president in almost all of U.S. history against native nations. The civil rights movement, as good as it was, did not get us there. President Trump does not believe we the people means all the people. This nation likes to tell itself that it has this grand vision of we the people meaning everybody and saying that it loves democracy. Well, for a nation that loves democracy, we sure do a really good job of keeping people from voting. For a nation that loves to say we, we are the inclusive we believe in equality and freedom, yet we incarcerate our citizens at the highest rate of any country in the world. We have foundations that still exclude. To this day, slavery is still legal. The 13th Amendment reads, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party has been duly convicted. The 13th Amendment didn't abolish slavery. It redefined and codified it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system 
And today, the United States incarcerates its citizens at the highest rate of any country in the world. And Native Americans are, in most states, the second highest incarcerated group of people. And in some states, we're the highest, especially where we have the biggest populations. The challenge is, is for all this nation likes what it likes to believe about itself, it has never made the intentional decision of do we really want to be a nation where we the people truly means all the people. And so I'm calling the question. When you're on a board sometime and you have a long debate and people are going back and forth and there's a lot of people lined up, eventually someone will stand up and say, I would like to call the question, which means we're going to end the debate after the people who are in line talk and then we're going to vote and we're going to make a decision. And I am telling the United States of America, I want to call the question. Let's stop pretending that we're this. Let's stop saying that we're that and let's actually make a decision. Virginia ratified the ERA as a state a couple days ago, I think it was. But they've missed the deadline. And so the Equal Rights Amendment is not going to become law. It's not going to become an amendment. Our nation, as much as it likes to trumpet this fact that we believe in these things, we do not do a very good job of delivering them. And my campaign is about calling the question. If we want to be a nation where we the people truly means all the people, we have to do something about land titles. We have to abolish slavery. We have to address that missing and murdered indigenous women and girls exist for a reason, and it's because our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution exclude those people from who is actually protected. And so I, I want, I thank you for allowing me here to speak. I am so thrilled that this forum is taking place. I truly believe that there is power within Indian country, but not just to only affect the vote in seven states. Indian country in and of itself has the power to put me on the ballot in all 50 states. Indian country has the power within itself to shape this election all the way through to the end. And if we partner well with other marginalized groups and with millennials and Gen Z, we might even actually be able to put me in the White House. My relatives, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Thank you for the work you're doing to make this nation a better place. And thank you for holding on to remembering your tribal identities, your culture, your languages, and your history and standing up so that we can no longer be ignored. Akehat, my relatives, walk in beauty. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Thank you, panelists, for very thoughtful questions.